again, thank you so much for the privilege to come and uh, minister with you today. If you have your Bibles, please take them and turn in them, if you would, to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, as we look at verses 14 through 19. And uh, what a wonderful thing it was to be able to drive to church with my wife this morning. Boy, for about 40 years, we always took separate cars. And then when we had three kids and they were driving, there's sometimes up to five cars. And boy, the church looked like it was well attended that morning, judging by all the cars that were in the parking lot. And, uh, and uh, so now, anyway, it's, uh, it's glad. And, and uh, I don't know, if Sharon, it's, most of you know her, but some of you don't. But here she is over here. And she didn't want me to embarrass her, but I just did. But anyway. Oh, well. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, there's a famous British Bible scholar of several generations ago named William Barclay. He just has a wonderful commentary and uh, with great historical significance that's uh, used as part of his work and still current today. And he wrote this. He said, that this world is a disintegrated chaos. There is division everywhere between nation and nation, between man and man, and I think most poignantly says within a man's inner life. Because isn't that where all the strife starts? It's in the heart of man, isn't it? The Bible tells us the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it in Jeremiah? And certainly the truth of those words that were penned uh, nearly 50 years ago and are sadly demonstrated today, we say in Eastern Europe, of course, with the Ukraine situation there, Russia. We see it in the Middle East, the ongoing strife there, Iran and whatnot, and the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, all those things going on the African continent, Sub-Sahara, South Africa, and, and just all the, the famine and the fighting and everything that goes on. We see it in our cities, in our nation's capital, our suburbs, our streets, on our school campuses, in our homes, on the evening news, and then again, in ourselves, in ourselves, don't we? Barclay continues, though, he says, it's God's design that all the discordant elements should be brought into one in Jesus Christ. But that cannot be done unless the church carries the message of Christ and of the love of God to every man. And certainly, again, those words were true in Barclay's day, ever so true today. The message of Christ, the love of God, is the good news, the gospel, as we've just observed in a very literal, physical form. Jesus Christ dying on the cross for sins, for the sins of the world, rising again and salvation simply by receiving his free gift of eternal life by faith the message the gospel is the power of god unto salvation the scripture tells us romans 1 16. it's a power that's released we see though through prayerful dependency on god and we're talking about prayer today we know of course jesus in his humanity ministered in the power of prayer to his father We see he taught his disciples to pray. We pray the disciples' prayer, the Lord's prayer, if you prefer, in like manner. The the apostles, including Paul, demonstrated that prayer is essential, absolutely essential, to the effectual ministry of the gospel for people not only to come to saving personal faith in Jesus Christ, but also to grow in sanctification and conformity to the likeness of Christ. And for us, prayer is... For true spiritual power, God's power in our lives is essential. But the question I ask of myself and of us as an assembled body as well is, do we pray as we know that we ought? Do we pray as we know that we ought? I'm privileged to be a part of an ongoing prayer group that's met for, I don't know, probably over 30, maybe 40 years. And right now it's being hosted right here at Red Rocks Fellowship on Wednesday mornings. And so uh, I, I join with uh, Pastor Matt and a number of others, pastors, Christian leaders in the area. And this week, uh, Shane, who's a pastor, elder at another church, small group leader, uh, told about his experience a number of years ago at his former church at an elders meeting. The, the pastor went around the circle and he asked each of the elders, how much do you pray? And one of the elders spoke up, well, I pray about three times a week. Another said, well, about 15 minutes a day something like that, and and, uh, the rest answered in a similar way, and and Shane said he was just absolutely stunned. Here are the spiritual leaders of the church, and is this all they pray? And he said from that time on, he was just radically transformed 
in his own prayer life as well as he is today. And so today as we come to uh, Ephesians here, chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, we consider just the wonderful prayer (laughs) of the many wonderful prayers of the Apostle Paul and of course of the many wonderful prayers in the scriptures uh, that are examples to follow. Now keep in mind that in context, the Apostle Paul has explained to the Ephesians uh, the mystery, the mysterion, which is, is a truth formerly concealed but now revealed and uh, revealed through the Apostle Paul about Jews and Gentiles being called together in one body, unified in Christ. And he has affirmed his apostolic call to proclaim that message. He's extolled just the wonderful things that God has done for the Ephesians and us by application in our salvation by grace through faith in Christ and in his body, the church, and and the great privilege and opportunity that we have through Christ in prayer. As he said in the preceding context in chapter 3, verse 12, it says, in him and through faith in him, that's Jesus, of course, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. And this freedom and confidence in prayer motivates the Apostle Paul to prayer as we see picking up in verse 14 here of Ephesians. It says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Father, as we look at these words penned through the Holy Spirit inspired mind and heart, and ultimately through the quill of the Apostle Paul. Uh, Lord, your word is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Do its work in my heart and each of our hearts and lives. Lord, that we may be equipped, furnished unto every good work, and especially motivated and enabled more through this example of prayer and the power of your word to pray as we ought. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You think what a magnificent majestic prayer of spiritual depth that just stands in such contrast to the so often shallow and self-centered nature of my own prayer life, I admit. Uh, we, we see that Paul's uh, selflessness in prayer here on behalf of the Ephesians just stands in marked contrast to the prayers that I often hear for the earthly concerns which uh, so often occupy our prayer lives. And uh, let me quickly say, no doubt, Paul was just immensely concerned for the Ephesians' trials and troubles. They they, they had issues. They had challenges like the rest of us have, you know, sickness and sorrow and painful losses and and grievous things that happen and the like. And Paul cared, and God cares about the things that concern us too. The hairs of our head are numbered. He sees every sparrow fall. Yes, yes, we don't ignore that at all. Uh, But nonetheless, we see that just the petitions of this prayer just transcend just the earthbound, superficial focus that seems to characterize and preoccupy the prayer life of so many people, and yes, Christians included as well. This prayer, as I mentioned before, along with the many other wonderful prayers of the Scriptures, presents just such a high pattern for us to not only follow Uh, but also to fulfill the the desperate need that I have, that we have for spiritual power, both to apprehend and experience the love of Christ in the far deeper way. As Paul wrote, for this reason, for this reason. For what reason? If we could scroll ahead in the uh, outline here. He says, Paul has just explained how God called him to share the gospel with the Gentiles. Here are the Ephesians that included both Jews and Gentiles that heard the gospel message from the likes of Apollos, even though they had heard it. He was only familiar with uh, the baptism of John uh, until Priscilla and Aquila took him aside. But they'd heard the message from the likes of him and also Priscilla, Aquila, and and others, no doubt, and believed. But here they are discouraged. They're, They're losing heart because of Paul's sufferings. And we also know from, of course, the later letter to them in the letters to the seven churches the apostle john yeah i know it was 30 years later something like that revelation 2 4 
but they were clearly in danger of losing their first love, as, as all of us certainly run that risk as well. And, and this all, I believe, motivated Paul to fervent prayer in their behalf as he continues, as I kneel uh, before the Father. Uh, we're told historically that the ordinary Jewish posture of prayer was standing with the hands stretched out and the palms upwards. Uh, in the early church, though, according to the church father Eusebius, he referred to kneeling as the familiar custom of Christians that, as one has said, as uh, Wood in his commentary says, it symbolizes the submissiveness, solemnity, and adoration we must have before God as we kneel before him. For Paul says literally, I bend my knees before, cross that particular word, literally meaning facing the Father. Uh, going back to Barclay, he suggests that Paul's prayer to the ch for the church is so intense that he falls on his face before God in an agony of entreaty. And certainly, as we observe, that it speaks of the consciousness which Paul had when praying, that he was directing his prayer to God who was listening while he prayed. Appreciated what Joanna reminded us. God hears and answers our prayer, as, as we sang as well. And so in contrast to the religions of the world, we worship the one true creator God. God is one. But who, as Paul reminded the Ephesians, eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as uh, he referenced earlier in Ephesians 2.18, as we see the Trinity mentioned there as well. For through, for through him, Jesus, we have access to the Father, by one spirit, all brought together there. And, and so from Paul's example in prayer here, I think our first reason why it is our privilege and our responsibility to exercise this wonderful access that we have and enjoy to come into the presence of our triune God in intercessory prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ as believers is because we all pray to the same Heavenly Father. We share the same Heavenly Father. The story is told of a little boy whose father was promoted to the high rank. He was a military brat, <laughs> high rank of Brigadier General. And uh, when the little boy heard the news about his father being promoted, he was silent for a moment, and he said, do you think he will still mind if I call him Daddy? Do you think he'll still mind if I call him Daddy? And of course, we know the answer to that question. Of course not. And in that same way, we share the same Heavenly Father, all who trust in Jesus for salvation, can boldly come into the presence of our holy God, our Heavenly Father, and pray, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. And so as believers, we're not only ones who share the same Heavenly Father, we're members of the universal church, uh, the body of Christ that consists of all believers in Him everywhere, no matter their distinctives, no matter their labels. We're a part of the same spiritual family, and for that reason, we share that common access to God, the Heavenly Father, Abba Father, which leads to a second and closely related reason to pray like Paul as we work our way through the text, and that is because we belong to the same spiritual family. We not only share the same Heavenly Father, we also belong to the same spiritual family from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now, of course, as you come to any text, there's interpretive questions that arise, and uh, uh, there's just a couple of them I might mention. First, people might wonder, does uh, that phrase, family in heaven, uh, is that referring to angels? Or is that referring to departed saints? Uh, does it infer some sort of a mystical union that we have with them? And it seems to me, though, it's best to understand in context that the whole family in heaven and on earth and includes the spiritual family of believers in Jesus Christ, both on earth and in heaven, all called saints, because he's a holy God who has imputed his righteousness to us in Christ. And so I'm sitting here in the company of a whole bunch of saints. <laughs> is it you a saint? <laughs> yeah, biblically uh, to are. think that uh, Paul is going to immediately contradict what he has just written about salvation back in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. So moving along. As I look at Paul's very sublime example of prayer, I see as a first observation, again by application, that like Paul, it's our awesome privilege and our responsibility as well to pray to our Heavenly Father for our brothers and sisters in Christ. If we could move ahead in the outline there. As believers in Jesus, 
children of God, members of his family of faith. It's our privilege, yes, and responsibility to often come before our Creator and Savior, our Heavenly God, our Heavenly Father, and pray reverently and fervently to Him in intercessory prayer for our spiritual family as the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesians. I think of Tom and Kathy, uh, members here for many years who have since moved away. Uh, I've had the privilege of being in their home on occasion, and their practice then was, as I'm sure it continues as well in their new location, was they had actually had a card file on their kitchen table with the names of missionaries, of family members, of friends, others for whom they systematically pray. And I think, what an example they set in the practical way for me and others to follow in the faithful intercessory prayer. I, I write prayer requests down in a little spiral notebook. You have your own pattern as well. But we need to be praying. And, I, and I'm encouraged to hear about the Monday night prayer gathering that's happening here and, uh, and, and groups as uh, women get together, teens get together, the youth, congregation, men, Prayer is so important, and so that's wonderful. Now, as believers in Jesus, the apostle has already reminded us that in, uh, through Ephesians that uh, we are an undeserving recipients of, uh, as, as we go to the next text there, of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, of every spiritual blessing in Christ. He's, we're undeserving recipients of the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. He's talked about God who is rich in mercy. Uh, do you see a theme here about rich, <laughs> the incomparable riches of his grace, uh, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, spiritually speaking, in Christ, we're spiritual pl plutocrats. That's that word is there in the original. Uh, plutois is that particular word. We are rich, filthy, stinking, infinitely spiritually rich in him. Uh, not filthy, stinking, that, that was bad, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, but our spiritual power originates from that same infinitely full storehouse of grace, which is the theme of Ephesians. And so as we continue into verses 16 through 19, the Apostle Paul presents three interrelated intercessory petitions for the Ephesians, which are certainly applicable for us too. First, Paul initiates this requisition, verse 16. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you. Let's stop there. This is kratai ao, strength. Uh, the same word that's used of Jesus who became strong in spirit uh, back in Luke 180. Uh, in, in his earthly ministry, Jesus relied upon that strength through the power of the Holy Spirit as he continues in verse 16 there, with power through his spirit. This is dunamis type power, resurrection power is referenced back in chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. In your inner being. You know, popular psychology says we all have an inner child. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the truth, biblically speaking, though, is we have an inner anthropos. We have an inner man, uh, literally. That word, inner person. It refers, uh, let me borrow from Lou and Ida here in their lexicon. It says, it refers to the psychological faculty, including intellectual, emotional, and spiritual aspects, in contrast with the purely physical aspects of human existence, the inner being, the innermost being, inwardly. In other words, yes, we are physical and we are spiritual. We have an inner person, an inner man. And that we need that power in the inner man. And it's through prayer that we enable that inward power that comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit in every believer and that we also desperately need for victorious living and the power that results in this end that he prays for, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. What's that word dwell? Meno, that particular word. Dwell. According uh, to one source that I checked, you know, no less of an authoritative source than Google, but I looked it up, and uh, according to one, the average length of home ownership is 16 years. Um, we were privileged to buy our house back in 1988. We've lived in it for 34 years, so I guess you could say that we dwell in our house, um, and that's in literal usage. Uh, that word dwell, again, Luanida, means to live or dwell in a place in an established or settled manner, to live, to dwell, to reside. So, do you reside in your house? I'm, I'm sure you do. 
Uh, according to another source, this is gratuitous, but uh, the average length of home ownership, according to them, it was 13.2 years. And the same source, again, this was for free, claimed that the poor and the uneducated tend to stay in their homes any longer. I kind of took that personal. <laughs> And I was saying to myself, do you suppose they're including people like Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world who continues to live in the same relatively modest home there in Omaha that he purchased in 1958 for $31,500? They think about Warren Buffett, you know? <laughs> I've been to a little school, you know? Uh, but anyway, that was okay, I've added. Uh, Christ is to dwell in our hearts by faith, not as a transient yes, but to abide to reside in our inmost being. And the question is, does Christ dwell in that way in your heart and in mine by faith? Or is he more like an occasional guest, a visiting tourist? Or is he a permanent residence who meno dwells? And for him to dwell in my heart and life and yours takes prayer. And so we come to three what I'm calling power petitions that Paul teaches us to pray. And the first is for Holy Spirit power for Christ to dwell in our hearts. Kenneth Taylor in his New Living Translation renders it this way. I think you've got it up on the screen there. He says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Is Christ at home in your heart and mine? There's a sign on the uh, entranceway to an English castle that was open to the public for tourists. It reads this way. It says, It is the duty of the host to make his guests feel at home. Again, that sign says, It's the duty of the host to make his guests feel at home. And then it goes on to say, kind of dry British humor here. It says, It is the duty of the guests to remember they are not at home. <laughs> it's the duty of the guest to remember they're not at home. And uh, Pastor Steve Cole, who I stole this from, he observes, he says, with regard to Jesus Christ dwelling in our hearts, the first part of that duty applies to us. We need to make Christ feel at home in our hearts. We need to make Christ feel at home in our hearts. And so I ask, do you and I intentionally pray for Christ to feel at home in our hearts? Or or do we just presume upon him? He's God, he can do whatever he wants, you know? Uh, or do we embrace the process and participate through prayer? Uh, Cole continues, however, he says, the second part does not apply to Christ uh, because he does not come into our hearts as a guest, but as the rightful owner. He bought us with his blood. When he comes to dwell in our hearts, he's taking possession of that which is rightfully his. Early in uh, my discipleship experience, I was challenged by a little pamphlet that was written by Robert Lloyd Munger entitled, My Heart Christ's Home, My Heart Christ's Home. How many of you read that? Are you familiar with that? It's one, yeah, it's a classic. I mean, that was 50 years ago, and we're still reading it today. Wow. And, uh, you know, he takes us on the tour of the various rooms in the home of our heart. The workroom, the living room, the dining room, the bedroom, the closet, so forth, with the question, is Christ at home in every room of our heart? Or are the doors to one or more of the rooms locked? And we hold the key to that room. We haven't quite given it up yet. You know, we ask, what about our hopes? What about our dreams? What about our ambitions, our desires? J. Hudson Taylor, China Inland Mission, now on death. He says, if Christ is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. If Christ is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Well, Paul continues, and I pray that you being rooted, the idea is to become strengthened with focus upon the source of such strength, firmly rooted. I think of a tree with that center taproot just driven deep into the rich and nourishing black humus soil, particularly of love. I pray that you being rooted and established the idea is to be grounded, the foundation for. You think of a solid foundation on a bedrock of love, in love. And boy, it's 11 o'clock. When does the trap door spring here? I got a, I've heard that Matt, Matt sometimes goes over. Do I have that privilege or can I? Oh, okay, all right. Well, I don't get in trouble here. Uh, he might not invite me back. But uh, you know, the Greek language has several words for love, at least four of them that have been kind of popularized. Of course, there's eros, love, uh, 
uh, what's the essential romantic love, erotic, uh, that word comes from it. That's the kind of love our, associate, uh, our culture associates most with the concept. Uh, a word that does not, of course, appear in the New Testament. A storge love, um, in the New Testament it appears twice, that word storge, ostorge, alpha privative, which refers to natural human affection, which will be lost in the latter days. Uh, we're in the latter days, aren't we? Ostorge love. Uh, the phileo love, filial, uh, we think of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, a word that appears quite often in the New Testament. Of course, the, uh, the big word is agape love, the most common word. And of course, that's what the word the Apostle Paul lose, uses here as well, uh, agape love. Of course, defined and explained thoroughly, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, agape love, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is not a natural love. It's a supernatural love. It takes prayer, power of the Holy Spirit, uh, not only to bear this, what it would be the first and foremost fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.22, fruit of the Spirit is what? Agape, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, you know, on and on. Um, but to be rooted and grounded love as well for this important end, that we may have power, verse 18, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And, the, the Apostle Paul, of course, here is telling us that the love of Christ just exemplified in his grace to the Gentiles and the Jews as well, and uh, to be all included together. It's too large to be confined by any geometry. I was never good at geometry. I know we have some engineers here. Uh, you know, you're good at the math and all that. I never gained a grasp, but I, I was kind of like, what does a liberal arts major say, you know, in his career? You know, do you want fries with a happy meal? You know, that, that's me. But not always, you know, through prayer we can grasp the geometric dimensions of Christ's love. As, as one has said, and, and these are all based on references through Ephesians, it's wide enough to reach the whole world and be long, beyond, as set forth in chapter 1. It's long enough to stretch from eternity to eternity, again in chapter 1 and chapter 3. It's high enough to raise both Gentiles and Jews to heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are sitting in the heavenlies, you know, looking down, <laughs> positionally in Christ. It's deep enough to rescue people from sin's degradation and even from the grip of Satan himself, as Wood says in his wonderful commentary. That's the love of Christ. And it's the love that he has for a unified, united body for those who trust in him as well, personally as individuals. That, that's kind of a scholarly quote from a commentary, but somehow it doesn't maybe quite touch the heart like that little Sunday school chorus that I remember from childhood and you do too know well, you know, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. We are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And as my California nieces and nephews by marriage said, they'd sing that song, yeah. <laughs> Can you affirm that today? Can you affirm that today? Are you willing to pray a second power petition for yourself? I would next ask for someone in your life who desperately needs it. And that is for Holy Spirit power to grasp the love of Christ. There's that majestic hymn that comes from our Scandinavian free church heritage, our forebears, entitled The Love of God. Those majestic words, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. And so it takes Holy Spirit power through prayer to not only fully grasp the love of Christ in that exponential geometric proportion and all those dimensions, but to know the paradoxical love of God in Christ, which is a third power petition, and that's for Holy Spirit power to know the unknowable love of Christ. Because the real truth of the matter is that the kind of love we're talking about is humanly impossible to fully know takes the power of the Holy Spirit unleashed through prayer as we see and to know this love that surpasses knowledge can also go to knowledge that's used here to possess information to have knowledge of I don't know why he didn't use epigenos because I, I like that word better but this too though is one of the many paradoxical statements of scripture as well as Wood says but even though the love of Christ surpasses human knowledge it says, observing, uh, observe Theophylact, who is an 11th century scholar, he says, yet you shall know it if you have Christ dwelling in you. You shall know it if you have Christ dwelling in you. Now we know that positionally in Christ, this uh, divine playroma fullness of him 
It's already ours. It's a spiritual reality. The fullness that is given to us, we have it. As Paul wrote to Colossians, he says, for in Christ, Colossians 2, 9 and 10, the fullness, the pleroma of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given that pleroma fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. But yet to realize this fullness in our spiritual experience, more and more it takes this kind of specific prayer that we see in verse 19, that you may be filled to the measure of all the pleroma fullness of God. So let me ask, circle back. For what do you pray? Do you and do I pray for this kind of power for others, for yourself too? Do you pray to be strengthened in the inner being by his power? Do you pray that Christ may dwell in their hearts and yours by faith? Do you pray that they and you, might be your wife, might be your husband, might be your son, your daughter, your employer, your neighbor, as a believer, they may be rooted and established in love and that do you pray that all of us will be in, enabled to grasp the love of Christ in all his dimensions, his love for us, his love for the world, his love that he has for us to demonstrate in our sacrificial actions and words for others, for a lost and dying world. Do you pray that we may know this kind of love that surpasses knowledge, and since God is love, to be filled to all the measure of the fullness of God in this respect. And so like Paul, in closing, it's our awesome privilege and responsibility to petition our Heavenly Father, for Holy Spirit power for our brothers and sisters in Christ in this way. Archbishop Trent is quoted as saying that prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of His highest willingness. And so since again, it's our awesome privilege and responsibility to petition our willing Heavenly Father for this kind of power to know, to exhibit, to experience this love of indwelling Christ. I'm, as my invitation of commitment, I'm going to invite you all to join with me as a congregation and pray this prayer again. And if you want to kneel, I, that'd be very appropriate. Um, and it's okay. Yeah, you don't have to bow your head and close your eyes. Let's pray together in unison as we go to this text again. Would you read it with me as a prayer and think of someone for whom you might be praying? Let's together say, For this reason... I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.